Hello, and welcome to Monarchism Unfiltered. I'm one of your hosts, Mikulsk. And I'm your other host, Bronze. And on today's episode, we've decided to touch upon a topic we've covered previously on the show, hydraulic camp buyers. Memory serves, I think we mentioned it passively in episode two, green energy and the Middle East. Well, if we're talking about hydraulic empires, it would be the Middle East, I guess. Sounds about right. Mm Mm-hmm. So, the main issue here with uh, renewable energy sources and yada dee and yada da is that, ultimately, oil is on the way out. And for the contemporary hydraulic empire, well... Oil is what gives the hydro part in the hydraulic empire the control of uh, the control and access and maintenance of oil being the major underpinning of the system, of the state's functioning, if not necessarily internally uh, for its internal stability, then uh, necessarily so externally for its international relations. Now, it's not necessarily true that every single Arabic country necessarily operates as this. But uh, a significant and notable amount of them do. Now, the pertinent of this, well, before, before, we, before we go on this, I guess we should explain at least again, we never know when someone's listening to this, uh, what an hydraulic empire is. Suffice to say, as the name implies, it's a term referred to a type of state typically in historical context, though it has been used in Monday foreign policy, to refer to a state that operates by the control of a, by the control of a liquid, basically. Now, traditionally, this has been water or irrigation, the stereotypical hydraulic empires being ancient Egypt, the Mesopotamian city-states and empires, and uh, early dynastic China. You the engineer, baby. You the engineer. Where the maintenance, uh, control, and uh, uh, and ba- basically just things dealing with these irrigation canals and irrigation in general, being so central to the state's functioning that entire bureaucracies were developed outside of this. In a more contemporary sense, it refers to the typically Arabic, though, not, though again not necessarily exclusively so, states who operate on a similar notion, but rather than oil, and, uh, but rather than water and irrigation, with oil and petroleum. The logic is less, uh, I mean, there is both ins and outs. Uh, There's both an internal dynamic to this and external dynamic. Internally, it's that typically the tremendous amount of money made via oil experts is used to, and especially in the case of Saudi Arabia, to sustain an incredibly generous um, welfare state, for lack of a better term. Well, it's not for lack of a better term. It is a welfare state, no matter how you cut it. Um, Other, uh, most, uh, most, most oil-based hydraulic empires typically do this. It's one of the benefits. Now, we're focusing particularly on the Middle East on this one because, well, it's... Well, not to say we, we've we reached peak oil in terms of, from this point onwards, oil will just... Its price will reach an impossible height because it will become rarer and rarer. We've reached peak oil in the sense that it is unlikely for the price to ever rise again. And so, well, for the average consumer, this does not mean much. For the states and the potential new paradigm they face, it is uh, potentially quite damaging. I mean, it means quite a lot to the average consumer. Well, I suppose. I, I guess I guess as a person that uses a lot of public transportation, that's not really something that impacts me that in, that intensely. No, but other people do exist, McGosk. Um Preposterous until proven otherwise, I dispute the notion. That's, yeah, fair enough. In any case, now, as some of you might be aware, some of you might not, Green energy, and especially uh, investment in renewable energy sources, is kind of a big deal, with China leading the world, but perhaps less publicized, or more accurately, less fear-mongered, is the, is the um, 
the various states in the, uh, var the various states in uh, the Arabian Peninsula are doing this. While traditionally their efforts have been more so in lessening their dependence on oil by just diversifying their industrial base, which is sensible policy. Another thread that is also happening is that many of them are now starting to invest co quite considerable amount of money into, well, not necessarily new energy sources, but development and testing and experimentation. Yeah, there's well, a lot of different types of initiatives about like creating new types of energy and, um, you know, in, in different countries you know and in in the middle east uh the biggest one would for uh geographic reasons be solar energy because you know that works sort of quite well in the middle east yeah uh wasn't uh wasn't you that said it was the uh arab emirate states uh, the united arab emirates that's the one that recently developed, like, not developed, but actually brought to mass use a sterling battery. Well, uh, I, don't know, I don't know about brought to ma mass use, but they've started um, using it. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's a sort of new technology that uh, was developed in, in Sweden. Uh, because uh, for those of our listeners who don't know, one of the key issues of solar power is that there's a very clear curve of, of, of when you create energy with solar, which is that, you, when it, and it's, you know, it peaks at noon, and then it's, it's sort of like a curve, you know, essentially you make a lot of energy during the day and very little energy in the evening, morning, and night. But people use energy at a reasonably consistent rate throughout the day uh, that or because you and you might think oh well I don't use that much what, what energy am I using at night but you know in a society because you know we live in a society there's all sorts of processes and stuff that's going all the time so energy use is pretty consistent throughout the day but if solar energy production is inconsistent that leaves a very clear dilemma because you need to have the capacity to store enough energy from the energy you create during the day that you can store it during the evening to to use it. And this has traditionally been a very great problem for the solar energy. And there have been uh you know there's been multiple ways of, of dealing with this. The most obvious one that has a few flaws is using uh, chemical batteries, you know, also known as batteries. But there's many problems with batteries. They're expensive. They're quite bulky. You know, they're hard to manufacture in sufficient quantities. There's environmental concerns. There's safety concerns. Uh, then there has been, uh, I believe this was a while ago, but I think it was in Tunisia. God, I, I don't want to say something wrong, but um, in which they were, instead of using energies like solar cell panels, instead they would just use mirrors that they would uh, all point to a water tower. Uh, you know, one mirrors are cheaper than solar cells, and so you can obviously lay more of them down. And so if you just use them to reflect sunlight onto a water tower to heat up the water create steam you can drive a turbine and though it's not intuitive a turbine is in itself a sort of energy s storage system because it's a storage of kinetic energy because even after you know and obviously we're talking about massive industrial turbines so it has a lot of inertia meaning that it, all throughout the night it can keep on spinning on the energy that you put into it during the day but the newest step is to use a thermal battery, which is a very simple idea, uh, where you use the electric energy created by the solar cells to heat up a large volume of aluminium. The aluminium then melts, and obviously it then stores a lot of heat, and the heat is energy, and then 
this aluminium volume radiates energy. Specifically, you can use it to, to heat up water. And then, and then you can use that radiant heat to power a Stirling engine. Uh, should probably explain what a Stirling engine is, in case that some would, other people don't know. Yeah, it's 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 not exactly something that is common knowledge, sadly. Mm. So Stirling engine is very interesting uh, type of engine. It's actually it in in its invention it precedes the steam engine. Well, mm. in its big bigness, I I mean they're roughly contemporary, you know, late eighteenth century England. Well, I mean, there were steam-powered things before that, but it precedes the steam engine as we kn would know it today. How, b how about that? Fair and, and, uh, so, uh, you should. And my explanation probably won't be enough today. You should probably look up because you, the, you know people that have visual aids and examples of them working. But essentially, it is a, it is a type of engine that through air pressure makes creates energy out of air okay so okay a sterling engine has two plates and if one of the plates is cold and one of the plates is hot it has um what's it called so this is why I'm not an engineer there's a thingy that moves in between the pl uh, the the plates displacing air and if there's a difference in temperature between the two plates, that creates motion. Which obviously you can use that motion to drive a flywheel, which you know, and so on and so on and so on, and then there's there's power. Hmm. Yeah, but, but I, I mean I suppose the, the the absolute simplified is that the temperature imbalances affects the air in the cylinders and the the hotter air goes upwards and the cooler air goes downwards, thereby intrinsically generating uh, motion within them, thereby generating power, basically. So if you have yeah. so if you provide the e the heat or alternatively coolant, you can effectively generate a Stirling engine. The issue is that providing heat requires energy, and coolant typically has bigger logistical issues that that are not really relevant to to the matter at hand. Well, I mean, so, cooling is is uh, also energy. Because it's like if you have like a refrigerating system that, you know, because fridges work by moving heat away, away from the, that area. That's why, you know, the back of a fridge is hot. That also takes energy. Fair enough. So, yeah, the, the, the main issue is that is historically Stirling engines have have this conundrum. They also they also don't compress nicely. They compress yeah, or so expand. a Stirling engine. That's because a Stirling engine is actually a very efficient system. Uh, it is it is in a, you know more efficient than either a, a steam engine or an internal combustion engine. It's just that. If you want to make a powerful one, it's going to be really big. So you couldn't, for example, you couldn't have one in a train or a car or something like that, which or you know, which is why the industrial revolution was mostly not powered by Stirling engines. So it's essentially, it's a very it's a very efficient engine, but it's not a very powerful engine. Yeah, and it's so efficient. It, yeah. with it's efficient in regards to the amount of stuff put into the system. It's not necessarily, it does not necessarily have a, a high output. Yeah. But obviously, if you're using it in, a, in the context of something like a power plant, you're not that worried about it being small. That is true. I'm now kind of, I was now kind of wondering, why don't we have sterling power plants? You know, because you know you want to create a lot of energy uh, quickly, but obviously you know if if you have uh, although these new Swedish Stirling engines, I think the entire system fits in in uh, in a standard sized shipping container. That's one of the big selling points of the, of the you know, this thing. Hmm, that is pretty compact. 
it's also it's also logistically easy to to move. Just put it in a shipping container. Yeah. No, I mean that's quite a relevant size of thing. Yeah. Even if it's not necessarily compact, it's easier to it's easier to work with. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that's you know, so there's lots of new initiatives in all over the 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 Middle East. Uh you know, and and the world in general, trying to 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 figure out how we can invest in green energy. Yeah, because as this, the 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 implied point of this uh, podcast, I guess you could say, we're, 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 with each passing episode, we go closer to becoming a foreign policy think tank. Is that uh, we might see the we might see the rise of a new type of hydraulic empire, namely the the green energy hydraulic empire. Not necessarily unique, like unlike of the oil based hydraulic empire where where the relevance of the term was more towards foreign policy, I do think that the rise of a of a new hydraulic empire, this time not really based on anything liquid based really, uh uh, but on, but especially on internal dynamics will be a thing because like a key thing of all of all types of green energy is the finickiness and tentatively complex maintenance of it all. So I could definitely see some uh, some of the internal politics of many estates, obviously first subtly but then greatly shifting towards a new dynamic on the basis of this alone. I mean I I think there exists a foreign policy dynamic. Um in terms of the green energy empire. And that specifically, I think, comes down to information technology and intellectual property. That is true. So I mean, for example, I, I think in the case of the, the solar sterling system, I think you could say that there is a, a green energy empire at stake here, but I wouldn't say that it's the United Arab Emirates or Morocco. It, I, I would say that Sweden is 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 the one being the green energy empire. Yeah, because they In would hold all the context, patent rights. Right? Exactly. Yeah, because right? they hold the intellectual property because it's such an innovation-driven field. In the way that oil isn't. You yeah. can't, you know, you can't oil own the concept of oil refinery. Well, not anymore. So, but yeah, Could that you is ever? a fair. I mean, I'm sure the, Brit the the British Empire was willing to enforce that concept, even if in truth you couldn't. They would be willing. I, I, but you can't really own the concept of distillation. I don't think they made that claim. I, you know, because you know, oil is of course limited by geography, in the sense mm -hmm. that you know, the oil is where the oil is. Hmm. I mean, fair enough. There, there's also other market dynamics in the historical exploitation of oil that we're oh, kind absolutely of, that we're kind of that we're kind of brushing off. So let's let's still keep this centered on the on the polit on the sociological, political, and I suppose self-evidently economic consequences of 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 green energy. Because green energy, we uh, we think solar, uh, hydro, wind, eolic. We think of these big three, but depending on the person who you're talking with in the context in which you're inserted, we're forgetting the big fourth one, nuclear. Well, if you consider it renewable or not, that's... Personally, I don't, but... It, well, it's, it it's not so much that... I, don't, I, I think very few people would consider it renewable, right? Because, you know... Uh, your fissile material is obviously something that you have to extract out of the earth and it's not like it grows back or replenishes. However, it is can be seen as greener in the sense that it is less pollutant. So, and that's why many people advocate for nuclear energy on a sort of realist level. That we will not, that, you know, because if the argument is that we won't be able to develop the the these renewable energies, these cleaner energies, in time, it is better 
to adopt a very powerful system of energy, even if it's less optimal from an environmental point of view. Because, you know, from a realist perspective, that could be seen as advantageous. Well, yes, but that that same position does not take really into account the tremendous, 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 tremendous amount of damage that the storage of nuclear waste material has just in general. That's true. I think, you know, I mean, waste, nuclear waste is something that has to be thought about very carefully because obviously it is a problem that survives those that create it by a very significant degree. Has there, uh, has there ever been, like, are we now, has there nuclear waste now that has, that has been done, basically, well, essentially, that, like, it suffered its half-life, it's no longer radioactive and cancer-causing? Well, the thing is, I... is that a, a half-life is, is not a thing that passes. A half-life is a constant of any fissile material. For for the uh, for those who don't know Half Life, the direct the 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 scientific term which inspired the video game in this context means uh, to as as the term implies to a degree, it implies it's when imagine an object that is emitting radioactive waves. Half Life is when that amount of waves def uh, goes down by half, basically. Depending upon the fissile material and etc., this varies a lot. Straight, uh, make ask. I don't. No, I don't want. I don't want to be pedantic. like a pedant or anything. But it, strictly speaking, though that would be a corollary truth of what a half life is, the essence of that the half life is that it is when ha there. You know, essentially, imagine that you have. A, a, say a kilogram of fissile material mm -hmm. as it is radiating it is losing mass hmm. it would have to because that's what it's radiating away and then the half life of that material is however long it would, would take for there to only be 500 grams of, of it's of it left and if there's I mean, so if this you know, so like how however long it takes for it to be half as much from a mass point of view. Although obviously if there was half of as much of it, it would also emit half as much radiation. Fair However, enough. strictly speaking, it comes down to the mass. Because, because not all radiation comes in the form of waves. Okay, that is true. I mean, yeah, but another thing is that besides... Besi be okay, now, 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 dear listener, in this unexpected... And this unexpected uh, lesson about nuclear waste management, we also have to be aware of that. Uh, nuclear waste in of itself, because everyone's familiar with the, storage, with the storage issues. Oh, the barrels are leaking, and then there's now a nuclear spill. <coughs> Hopefully they're familiar with this from the point of fiction and not from actually experiencing the negative consequences of such. But even outside of this... Uh, somewhat insufficient amount of storing, vitrification, and not alternative to make it, because typical, typically post-nuclear waste is typically liquid and stored in barrels, but many, or some, decide to vitrify it, to make it solid, to make it easier to store. Here's the issue. Vitrification is not a neutral process, and more than once, uh, more than one nuclear disaster came not from the not from the turbines themselves, but from the vitrification plant that is self-evidently near the plants. Which is an element that people often forget. Like indeed, in, in general, the logistics of renewable, greener, whatever have you, energy is, so, is something that's often forgotten by the common person. I, I, oh, but you know, to 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 take up the new the devil's advocate position of nuclear power. It is also true that though you know nuclear power is quite a nebulous term, it is not a monolith. Because there are there are in fact many different methods of of nuclear power creation. 
right, and some of which have, uh, you know, improvements. So improvements have come in the waste aspect of nuclear power, like for instance, uh, thorium reactors, which many you know uh, probably are familiar with as this hot new thing, and they have a, a significantly uh, better waste aspect because they produce much less harmful waste. That is true. But still, even if even and if that isn't... Carry on. You, you finish your piece, I'll say mine. And the, and and you know, and there are there you know there are coming new types of reactors that can that do in fact run on the waste created by the old style of you know uranium based reactor. Well, oh, wow, that's now a thing. Weird. I remember when I was a young kid and I suggested that in the same way that 12-year-olds suggest, th- suggest world solution issues and apparently I was laughed at and now you're telling me that now this is a re- that that's a reality. Well, it's, it's, it's a potential reality. There is a working prototype, but it, yeah, it's not been implemented in a... I know, I know, I know. I know. If, if it would, yeah. I would be aware. It's, I just find it. It's, I just brought up that because I don't know. I'd find it hilarious in a way. Next up, we'll use leaves to cure cancer. Mark my words, people. Um, the base, uh, but still, I think that a lot of the misgivings, because as, as as we said earlier in this conversation, not everyone is exactly aware of the of the logistical concerns of running nuclear power. It's all, but we also have the very real fear of like it going kablooey, which no amount of security improvements will ever truly uh, will ever truly uh, abolish because it's inherent to nuclear fission. Sure, we now have power plants that are so bloody secure that you can almost that you can have a, uh, that you can have a rock concert in them and nothing bad goes uh, goes happen, but. If something does go bad, the the consequences are absolutely horrifying. Like it's it's an entire different ballpark than say I don't know, a, 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 an oil rig going up. Sure, it's tragic. Sure, the damage is still significant, but it is not as horrifying, not as potentially long term damaging, and I I I can't emphasize this horrifying as a nuclear disaster. While that is true, um, you know, you could say that to be alive and to and, and, and you know, being a society is to make choices. And and it's not like other options come with um, without their own risks. That is true. Right? I mean And you could argue that if the if the now re- quite minor risk but like is in likelihood of happening though major in its possible consequences would be a preferable alternative to live with than the looming sword of damocles that is climate change and so if we could replace uh you know fossil fuels with nuclear fuels that would still be an improvement that 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 is true in a way but wouldn't that be but wouldn't that then function as enabling for example because it's true that fossil fuels are a considerate amount of 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 pollution true but a lot of it also comes from other human actions that require energy in turn like there has to be a question has to be made that if we want to cl- to stop climate change, it's not so much about finding green old energies, though it's certainly that is an important part of it. But it's also changing our habits. Like okay, absolutely, sh- reduction is important in the debate, but but we can't we can't there there is no possible future in which we reduce global energy consumption to zero. Well, that's right. self-evident. That's not what I'm. That's not what I'm saying here. I'm talking about right. attitudes more than anything. Okay, but you know, because the thing is, though, is that the threat is imminent. I'm, I'm sure you would agree. Oh no, I absolutely agree. This is, it's bad. Right. It, it's 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 not it's not some problem that exists 
in the future. This is this is a this is a, like a right na- here and now state of emergency problem. That is and true. And so you could, so you could, you know, so it's like, yes, it is possible that going into a, a broad investment in nuclear will slow down the growth of greener energies. But how long, how much time do we have? Can we wait for it to get to a level where we, you know, where we can run society on solar, where we've reduced consumption by such an amount that it is now feasible to have a society run on these renewable energy sources? And I think there's a very strong argument to be made that we don't have that much time. Do we even have the time? Because, because like, bronze, like, yes, okay, we're talking about the environmental aspect, but, like, nuclear power can be weaponized. And, like, that's, that's a consideration also in the back of my mind as to why that, as to why going nuclear... I understand that it is literally the sort of the Mockleys, but we cannot, but we cannot paint nuclear power neutral, politically neutral from the outset. Because if we maintain the position of uh, li- nu- limiting nuclear proliferation, then we'll create an imbalance by a, a, a dual-faced power production monopoly and nuclear monopoly on the on those that already on those that already have nuclear weapons, or we'll create an even worse scenario. A free for all race to secret nuclear programs. While that is true, I think I think that there's a very wide gap between nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Though they are like, and though having nuclear power capabilities is a large step towards having nuclear weapon capabilities. I think that, you know, you shouldn't discount all the, all the other additional steps. That and I there, not, and, and in fact, there are, there are forms of nuclear energy that it's very difficult to weaponize. That is like true. Thorium. That is true. Well, yet, human engine, if uh, I'll remind you, Bronze, we are the species that can kill one another with but a simple rock. I do not think it, I do not find it impossible that some high, high fancy dandy technology cannot be weaponized. In fact, I have yet to see anything under the sun or the moon that is that has yet, that has not yet been weaponized many times over. Okay, I, can, I would like to change my uh, uh, remark to Thorium cannot be made into a, into a nuclear explosive as we understand it now. Fair enough, though I will admit that my previous con- that my previous outburst was on the basis of more phil- was a bit pedantic, I guess. Yeah, no, because- but I, I, yeah, but you could I, I certainly wouldn't put it above mankind to invent a new type of weapon for which you know you could weaponize. Thorium. Yeah, to 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 go slightly back to to earlier in the VC, the poli- the, the, the geopolitics of green power because like let, let's imagine let, like but because again as as some of the listeners may know I'm a political science guy and I utterly detest foreign relations so my main focus is internal dynamics but uh, for for once for once I, I'll, I'll I'll throw foreign relations a bone here. The new power, the new international power dynamics that could emerge uh, from from a, a wider shift to say solar, eolic, and water-based ones is not something to be discounted because I think a lot of people, especially when talking about about um, about about politics of green energy, they talk about oh the investment and the law and, and the uh, and in a short-term perspective of multiple states, but there's not really much a focus on how this reflects internally in the, in the functioning of the state, vis-a-vis, and, and contrastedly, how this might change foreign relations. Many of them, as you, say, as you said in your own piece, about how it's about controlling intellectual property and innovation, but I still think that there is an entire, that there's an entire political angle to the question that we are, that is kind of brushed aside. That could very well be. I mean, you are much more attuned to these things than I am. I mean, fair enough, though. 
I mean, I do need you here, at least if nothing else, to bounce uh, off my brain. Because, like, currently speaking, like, it's... While it is true that all the planet gets sun, uh, it does not get sun uh, equally. Currently, the... Uh, oh, Jesus Christ, I forgot the name of it in English. The meridian? The meridian. Is it the meridian? The thing... Do you mean the equator? That's the thing! The equator is, where, uh, is the area where you get the most amount of sun in the planet. Indeed, fact, some um, countries in the Sahara ha have pretty significant uh, energy plants in there. And Morocco, while not being there, it's, it, it is close enough, I suppose. So, like, I, I am here wondering, like, do you think, do you, do you think that the that the gr uh, that the new green energy market will allow a free for all attitude, that, or, or will you see the emergence of a new typology of hydraulic empire dominating its production? And well, more, so not I necessarily. Say, go on. So, how how are you imagining the the green empire? Well, basically, I have two big modalities in my hand, which is the modality one, which is the mixed one, EI. It's all three main renewable energy sources, so solar, uh, water, and wind. And then, you have the pure, and, I, and then you have the purest one, which is just one. So, be, because... The, 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 the base assumption here is, let's imagine here, you, you, you're, you're, a big set, you're a big country in the Sahara. All of them are fairly big countries, but you have a lot of land with a lot of sun bleaching it every single day of the week at all, and nearly all times. So let's imagine a hypothetical Sahara country just fucking bleeds itself nearly to death on solar, on solar production. Fucking... Goodbye dunes of the goodbye dunes of the Sahara. Hello, power plants. Till as far as the eye can see, you've reached the new standard of just heat. And I'm now considering, okay, what are the what are the consequences of this? Because now you have a state which has which is keyed to a fairly fragile and expensive to fix or replace the panel, the solar panels particularly. Uh, technology like this is this does not seem to me that a state that can afford to have a lackluster control over its various power plants. So like a pure a, a solar purist state would internally be a state that would put a lot of focus into into like out because these are large because these are largely sparsely populated and lacking in infrastructure. You would definitely see the state either outsourcing this to corporations to manage and to manage their own security and thereby essentially extirpate itself and therefore the new hydraulic empire is not a state but it is a corporation or it would essentially or would, or you would have a much tighter control on on um, not necessarily within the areas but on but with uh, going in, basically. You would have probably entire sections of the country that would be quarantined off for most people. Well, most people who don't live and work at the plant, which, by the scale I'm here imagining, would be a lot. But still, not, not, a, not, not by a long shot the vast majority of people in the country. This is an example of a solar purist state. Because like p power has pl plays a plays a dynamics here in politics. Like I'm spitballing here, Bronze. Like if you have any 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 smart ideas for this, then uh, then feel free to say them. Like this is not exactly I'm couch. Go on. Not quite sure I understand the the, the vision. So I I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat it back to you to see if I got it right. So, if there were a state, you know, let, let's let's imagine that this is a this is a Saharan country, and and it and it covers a you know it 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 builds a lot of solar panels, right? The then, you know, 
the solar power lobby, to put it in crude terms, would then play a powerful role in the country's politics. Ultimately, that depends because because this is kind of a difficult thing when we're talking about like hydraulic empires, the term past, present, and potentially future, is that in the past, and until fairly recently, the, the, the state was a concrete entity. We're now living in an age of an extreme fragmentalization of the state, no matter which way you cut it. So the question would be, essentially, would the power lobby still exist as a lobby, or would it just take over the country at that point? Because... The, the, because a, a key element to, the, to, to this scenario is that non-green forms of energy are ba- are basically discounted from the equation. E. I. There is no real alternative, and the logistical and the logistical compromises no longer exist. Say, like this is the far future. I doubt even our grandkids will get to see this uh, pl- play out in full because this would because in order for the questions and the intensity of the considerations put here to be to come out to play. I'll, the the currently existing logistics of like oil would oil and others non renewable energy sources would need to be gone. So there would be no true alternative to the green energies in this scenario, which I think is something I need to key in on. Well, it's it, it's it's uh, very difficult to imagine the future generations from now. Don't be that many. But at the same time, you do it's, have a point. D- 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 you know, I mean, imagining the future in general is difficult. I I I, I will consider like if, this. If, if 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 our grandkids aren't there to see it, that's I think meaningfully in the future. Okay, fair enough. I guess I was constru- uh, I was con- I was uh, constructing castles in the sky. Uh, still right because that is that is quite that's quite a few decades and so how that would how you know like what the state of play is you know how what a state looks like even would i think be difficult to imagine but let us let us try you know because you know I'm, i'm a good sport so i'm going to go along with the question uh, I think that the the term hydraulic empire or energy empire, you know, to put, you know, because that might be more appropriate, is we're not no longer pumping stuff around except perhaps molten aluminium. I think it breaks down. You think that is so? So you fundamentally subscribe to the notion that. Uh, it will be due to the nature of of the renewable energy sources. It will be impossible to like have producer nations and due to the market forces structurally dependent nations on on set producer nations in terms of power i think it would be difficult unless we're dealing with very small close together nations i suppose that i suppose you have a right, point right like- Right, like if 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 Belgium is a producer nation, I can I could I could imagine Luxembourg relying upon it. Good not but, France. Well, France perhaps, but I I couldn't imagine like the world relying on a on on a cabal of solar energy nations like it would, for example, OPEC or something like that, because. Oil is something that you can put into barrels and put into a ship or pump through a pipeline in a way that it's difficult to do with uh, so energy. True, but with, at the like same electric time, energy. But at and the same also, t- oil the is much more tied to geography than solar energy is. So, like, while there are climates, like as you mentioned, the Sahara. That would that, that lend themselves to creating solar energy. It 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 is not such that while there is oil in Saudi Arabia, there isn't oil somewhere else, right? It's very difficult to imagine a place in the earth where you can't 
meaningfully create renewable energy. So I don't think it comes down to the energy itself. So I think if we're going to see... And but via market, but not even via market dynamics, because like the 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 thing compounds infinitely, basically. So like a country could simply make energy production so insanely cheap, let's imagine that it fundament that it fundamentally annuls the economic incentive to actually produce your own. Wouldn't that technically fill the gap? Well, fill the gap. I, like, like. I suppose it would, but I, I find that though the future is very difficult to know, I find that hard to imagine. Plus, like the plus, this example does at assume some that point the, the, the laws of the thermodynamics would intervene. Well, and also like the 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 the, the example as it now stands. The, 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 the examples that now stands of, oh, market forces would make this to be the case. It, it just This assumes that no other country on the planet would start producing and their own energy source, even though economically inefficient, for the sake of simply maintaining political autonomy or something along those lines. So, yeah, the, 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 I can see the, the, my castles in the sky about uh, the future, the, the neo-hydraulic empire uh, have uh, have fallen uh, have fallen down into the uh, sea, or what's left of it by that point. However, I th I think there can exist such a thing as a green energy, a green technology empire, possibly. But surely, in that case, it's via the control of patents more so than necessarily of the power itself. Well, yeah, exactly. It's it's more so, well, not even something as to to put it in Sternarian terms as spook as patents, but even you know, in the control of people who possess the core competencies to create green technology. How so? Care to go in that, uh, into a bit of development uh, into a bit of detail? Well, it, like because if 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 you, if you think about like a modern, you know, not not even to mention what could possibly exist in the future, but even a, a, like a modern energy creation is a very techno technologically sophisticated process, right? There's there's a lot of knowledge that you need to have to be able to build a renewable energy system. So you think so? So essentially, your position is that renewable energy, rather than being a way out for the current dynamics of poverty in the world, will act to reinforce them, even because only the developed world has the technical know-how, resources, manpower—not necessarily manpower, but the technical know-how and already established logistical infrastructure to do it, and effectively via that maintain the current status quo. Uh, yeah, but if but if you look at, for example, hydraulic empires in the world today, right, or really any form of commodity empire, mining is a bit easier, but like oil is already a very te technologically sophisticated process. So if you're an aspiring hydraulic empire, most likely your oil, at least at the beginning, will be managed by foreign experts. True, but we saw what this resulted in the past. British petroleum being born out of quasi-colonial exploitation of southern Iranian um, oil fields. Right, except now the oil, it, you're no longer by, bound by the fact that the oil exists in southern Iran. But you could still, uh, but I could still see like some pseudo-colonial relationships emerging and being perpetuated, because like Absolutely. we're not exactly. I mean, we all we're already seeing it. I think. Really, uh, with whom would you would you wager with China, perhaps, and uh, and its investments in Africa? I th I think that's. I think China. Well, China is leading the charge in green technology in a major way. 
And I think that that is something that they are very much leveraging. But okay, but if, if it was not China the example you were thinking of, then which was? Well, as we're talking about earlier today, for example, uh, Sweden, though not a, like you, I w you wouldn't say, oh yeah, Sweden is like a green technology empire. I don't think there's any state as much as you could say there are hydraulic empires that you could say, oh yeah, no, that country is a green technology empire. But there's definitely countries that are doing green technology imperialism. Hmm. Green technology imperialism, the next frontier of imperialism. The next frontier of imperialism. Turns hey, out Lenin was wrong. There are more stages. Um, Jesus. Can't, can't, can't wait until the two bona fide Marxist Leninists who watch this, who watch this uh, write us the essays explaining to how no, Lenin was right. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a new stage. It's a new facet. Yeah, probably. Um, don't add us Marxist Leninists. It was a joke. Um, Though do add, uh, though if you do have the essay ready, do send it to our email. Yeah, I mean, if you have interesting takes at us, you know, on Discord or email or... I guess those are the ones. Um, those are the ones you could we have too on, 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 you know, you could, you could reblog us, but, you know. We have too much self-love to go onto Twitter, folks. Don't expect us to ever go there. Um, but still... Okay, but green because uh, because right now I'm like I'm like remembered of some almost guerrilla esque initiatives of like bruh, let's help the um, the war refugees by gil by giving them easy to use but not necessarily easy to make or maintain um, water filtrations and I'm like and I and I've always because like th this is getting well fuck it about getting sidetracked because you n okay listener. You might think, okay, now this is a bit far-fetched. Green energy, green energy, uh, imperialism, uh, pseudo-colonial relationships. Yeah, I think you guys are going that a bit far. Like most most green energy and renewable energy efforts in the in the underdeveloped world have typically been done by ch uh, on an almost charitable basis to help out and and. And as those of you more knowledgeable, this would even point out, due to the fact that these countries are so poor, they don't even have the previous infrastructure in place. So it's actually cheaper for them proportionately to go with the new infrastructure now than go with the old one and then change it, which is kind of a which is another hurdle, which is a hurdle that some developed nations have to overcome. But listener, much like the 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 food aid for Africa. Sending food to the hungry seems like a perfectly neutral thing. It, not even perfectly neutral, a perfectly morally righteous thing to do, and indeed it is. But it can be. It can, that can simply not be the case. Oftentimes, where uh, Western um, food donations arrive specifically at um, at harvest season, tanking the price of everything and basically leading to mass mass fa like uh, farmer poverty they like they they can't sell at a profit their farms go bankrupt and then no one uses the farms creating a negative feedback loop because it effectively created a structural dependency on the donations for everything to work to transplant this into a more relevant example if we give these underdeveloped nations the technology that they desperately need but we fundamentally control the means by which to produce more and maintain it the relationship will be colonial colonial esque right, i guess right but I'd, uh, but i didn't i i and i you know i don't want to put words in your mouth mouth uh, mouth but i think i don't think our point is oh, therefore developing nations should not employ foreigners with the core competencies to develop green technology. I don't think that's the point. No, because 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 like that would I be, guess that I, would be inane. Yeah, that would be I mean literally historical countries tried that didn't work well. Right, it's just uh, that that's an aspect of green technology that we should be conscious of. That's more so the the point. Yeah. 
I mean, we should be consciousness about these kind of things, no matter where. It's just a sad, it's just a tragic fact of life, really. Uh, yeah, and I, I think you know, on that bombshell, to to borrow an ending from Top Gear, because it's that we might le- you know leave this sort of meandering uh, green technology episode. Yeah. So Still, we should, should, we should all be conscious of others and, you know, smash like. Hit the subscribe. <laughs> Reblog uh, us on your Snapstagram. Uh, we've been Monarchism Unfiltered. I've been McCosk. I've been Bronze. Good night. <laughs>